Hello and welcome to a PrivCap webinar. I'm David Snow, a partner at PrivCap Media. And today we're joined by Ann Arlinghouse of KKR Capstone, Ted Belillis of Alex Partners, and Will Bundy, also of Alex Partners. We've got a great panel of experts. I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll be off to the races. Maybe we can start with Ted Belillis of Alex Partners. Sure. Thanks so much. Ted Belillis here. I lead our transformative leadership practice. We work with CEOs, uh, private equity investors, and boards on their most challenging leadership and cultural problems, creating value in, the, in their portfolios through people. And how about uh, Ann Arlinghouse from KKR Capstone? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm an MD at KKR working in the Capstone team, which is the portfolio operations team at KKR. Our mission is to work with our investment teams uh, throughout the investment life cycle, and in particular focus on supporting our management teams across our portfolio companies to drive value creation efforts. And um, have spent a lot of time over the last year thinking about responding to disruption. So excited to, to speak with you all this morning about the topic. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Will Bundy, I'm a managing director in Alex Partners Private Equity Practice focused um, almost exclusively on uh, value creation at the point of transaction. So working with investors and operational teams to identify the operational inefficiencies then help them underwrite that in the deal, deal making process. Um, I spent a lot of the last year working through baseline issues, um, as well as also trying to make sure that everyone understands kind of what is the impact of the pandemic and how does that look coming out of it. We're going to start right off. Uh, with a couple of visuals that Alex Partners has put together based on a recent survey they did. And I'm going to ask uh, Ted Belillis to briefly walk us through what we're looking at and why they helped to set the stage for this topic. We're kind of blown away by this. I mean, if, if you're all uh, able to see this, you've got on the x-axis, you've got the traditional credit cycle. So, you know, generally, <laughs> the economy has been able to be predicted uh, through economic cycles, particularly through the credit cycle. But we're finding that we're living through a period of so many disruptions, not just the pandemic, but economic cycles are becoming really largely irrelevant from the ability to predict the future. The cycles of disruption are more regular and more profound than any economic cycle. And this, this heralds you know, a, a whole sea change uh, in our economy. The second slide, it really comes out of our latest research. So we sampled over 140 private equity investors and uh, Portco CEOs, CXOs on a number of factors related to valuing human capital. And we asked the simple question, which is in this period of disruption, what are the most valuable levers of value creation? What are the biggest priorities of value creation in your portfolio companies? And leadership and human capital came out as number one. 69% of private equity investors, and ironically, coincidentally, 69% of corporate of Porto executives both selected leadership and human capital as number one. And second is organizational efficiency, and third, organic growth. And you know, this this actually this was our sixth annual survey. Our fifth annual survey found essentially the same thing. So it's it's very clear that creating value through talent from a private equity perspective is a time, is, is really something that's that's coming into its own. And on that note, um, why don't we throw the first question over to Ann Arlinghouse from KKR Capstone? And you know, on the subject of human capital, you know, what are you seeing with regard to the fact that so many employees in private equity on portfolio companies have entirely rethought what it means to work? and where work should take place, and even sort of the careers that they should be pursuing, what kind of opportunities and challenges does that present uh, to private equity firms as they try to make their portfolio companies uh, more competitive? Yeah, it, it's a great question. You know, I mean, reflecting over the last year, I think people really saw their work and home life start to blur together in a way that, you know, we hadn't before. We were all working out of our kitchens or bedrooms or spare rooms, and we heard each other's kids and pets in the background. And so in a way, work has, I think, become much more personal than it used to be for a lot of people. And so, you know, we have seen both in the data and, and sort of anecdotally across our portfolio, you know, our companies are trying to adjust to this as everyone starts to think of more and more about what they're looking for in their work. And, and I think that there's a trend 
you know, that's accelerating with the coronavirus pandemic that where people are looking for more meaning and they're expecting their employers to reflect their values or at least acknowledge them and also reflect different ways of working. And so I think, you know, right now there are two real imperatives that we're seeing our companies have to deal with in order to be really competitive in the war for talent. And one is, I think, around figuring out how to make flexible and hybrid work arrangements really work in the long run. There was, you know, an intense period over the last year where people were forced to do some unnatural things and experiment with, uh, with different ways of working. And I think, you know, we'll continue to see that as people start to return to the office in situations where, where people have largely been out of the office for the last year. So that, that's one area that our companies are really experimenting with uh, and, and working through different options to figure out how to make folks both happy and productive. And the other, you know, the second uh, imperative that I think our companies are, are dealing with is really around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, focusing a lot more effort around ensuring that not only do we have a flexible workplace, but we've got an equitable one as well, where people can bring their whole selves to the job. And I think that, you know, certainly one of the things that we've been focused on is supporting our companies to, to tackle both problems and, and have created a bunch of resources that enable companies to, to work through both, both angles. Will, from your perspective, um, you know, advising portfolio companies to private equity firms, you know, what are you seeing as far as the transformation in uh, the way talent even views itself? I mean, as far as the, ta- the way that talent even views itself, uh, and I'll just kind of a little bit on, on what, uh, what Anne was talking about as well, as a transition into that discussion, we're seeing a lot more uh, willingness to adopt those hybrid models. Uh, now, there's always a discussion on the operating model of the company itself and kind of what business you're in as far as what you can allow to occur within your within your organization in the, in the staffing models. Um, but what we are seeing is also that in, increased amount of inclusion, right? Um, I think that we've all been in the situation where, you know, I had to step off of a call in order to go deal with uh, a crisis in, on the home front. And I think that because of that, we've, we've started to open the aperture as far as what work really means and what we can allow our talent to, to do. Well, how does that manifest itself in the actual discussion of how talent is viewed? One, I think that talent is starting to see itself as more of a, a valuable resource. And you're seeing that both as far as cost of talent, um, right? And that's very well televised at this point where, you know, um, McDonald's is paying sign-on bonuses. Right, and but you're also seeing it in just what Ann was talking about before, where it is becoming a lot more about what is the company doing for me and how does it tie into my lifestyle, right? Uh, versus just the I'm a I'm a cog in the machine and making this all kind of come together and and be part of that machine. Um, I think that people are really starting to get that sense of I'm going to call it uh, personal entitlement of what they really view and value, and uh, last year has allowed them to do that. When I talk to private equity investors and CEOs, you know they're they're really they're really struggling around this issue of how to attract talent and how to retain talent. And increasingly, I think what we're seeing is we're living through a a disruption in leadership itself. So setting a vision, implementing a strategy, holding people accountable, paying them well, those are all table stakes. What, what effective leaders need to do now, really, we talk about four things. They need to capture the energy and the commitment of their employees. They need to connect authentically with them. They need to provide real, very clear purpose, mission, and values, what they stand for. And they need to cascade those, that mission and those values throughout their executive team. And finally, they need to transform, which means they need to to either strengthen or recreate a culture where there's behavioral sustainability, behavioral stability. A renewed culture will be an enabler of strategy. So what we're seeing in leadership is, you know, people saying, how do I do that? How do I, you know, how do I put people over profits? How do I show that I believe in putting people over profits? To Anne's point around diversity and inclusion, what do I, what am I, what do I stand for in that and how do I demonstrate to the 
five generations of workers in my company in some cases, how do I demonstrate that I'm really committed to that? I would just point out that, that it's not just leadership, it's followership, right? And we talk about what's important to millennials isn't necessarily what's important to Gen Z. Millennials have lived through two very, very serious disruptions already. They've lived through the Great Recession um, a little over 10 years ago. And of course, they've, they've lived, we're living through COVID right now. So that's, that's, that's done severe damage in some cases to their own career development, wealth creation plans. So the premium, David, really is on a new kind of leadership, a new ability of leaders of really being able to connect in a very authentic and meaningful way with their people. Great, Anne, maybe a quick follow-up question for you. You know, thoughts on, on leadership. Has, has the style and the approach of the CEO of your portfolio companies changed? And if so, how can private equity sponsors be supportive of, you know, guiding that transformation in leadership? I agree with Ted's overarching point that fundamentally leadership needs to be increasingly authentic and really consider the full set of stakeholders that are involved in a business. You know, at KKR, we have made broad-based employee ownership at our portfolio companies a key part of our approach. Uh, it's something that we've done for a long time in our many of our industrial companies and increasingly are, are rolling out across our whole portfolio. And I think that, you know, structurally, it's a great way for private equity owners to really support our leaders at, at businesses to make sure that everyone in a company is thinking like an owner and is sharing in the success of the company and the private equity investor. And, you know, having that sort of structural ability to align interests across the whole organization and sort of change the conversation. It's no longer about, you know, what senior management at a company thinks versus the employees. It's about everyone together building a more valuable business. And we found that it really leads to more employee engagement and, and fundamentally better businesses. Because when you empower everyone in a company to think like an owner, uh, you know, the best idea wins. And a lot of ideas get surfaced that potentially otherwise wouldn't. That, that's been one angle that, that I think we believe strongly in really helps to support this new kind of leadership that is, is required by the environment today. That's going to be one of the key pivotal roles of those leaders and the transformative leaders to kind of really kind of tie in those aligned incentives with the organizational mission in order to kind of bring the best of the person uh, to the future, right? Or bring the best of the person, person to the organization in the future. That's exactly right. I mean, you have people like Mary Barra of GM saying, you know, we want to create an environment where people can bring their whole selves to work. So again, never before have we have we seen such a premium on good leadership. And I think we we all know that we've, you know we've been in this we've been in this kind of global leadership stress test from the schoolhouse to the White House. So there's a real real premium where and, and of course in the war for talent, people can go where they want and choose. So it, it puts a huge premium on good leadership now. Well, let's talk about the fact that during a period of disruption like the pandemic, human capital stands out as a huge opportunity to, to upgrade, to make changes, to, to, to rethink. But there are other uh, moves from the offensive playbook that one might make. You know, our portfolio was really fortunate to be on the right side of a lot of COVID trends. We have big investments in digital content, essential consumer and retail businesses. And so luckily, you know, there, there were a number of areas where we could really lean into the the opportunity presented by the pandemic and you know in those situations i think we were able to work with management teams to really you know really support them really help you know get um additional resources and encourage them to to really lean into the market opportunity in other situations you know we had a few companies that were in heavily impacted sectors like travel and leisure and frankly, the crisis was terribly clarifying for those businesses. You know, we were fortunate to work with strong leaders across our management teams to navigate the issues. And I think this is, you know, an example of where you really see the benefits of long-term oriented PE ownership. A great example is Apple Leisure Group, where 
you know, they are a hotel manager and all-inclusive vacation uh, distribution company. And so, you know, their business essentially came to a total standstill by the end of March of, of last year. We were able to, to respond with really quick actions to stabilize the business. But at the same time, recognized that, you know, we were in this for the long run and so could take the time to assess our strategy, really just jettison anything that wasn't absolutely critical to the strategy. And that focus allowed us to invest, even in a, you know, a very difficult period, in key priorities for growth. And I think um, it's, an, it's also an example where the, the leadership played an incredible role. You know, our CEO there, Alejandro Reynal, launched a new five-year strategic plan in the middle of the crisis and really rallied the whole company around it and then backed that up with, you know, showing meaningful investments in technology to drive customer experience as well as resiliency and efficiency in the back office. And, you know, we were able to, you know, to not waste a good crisis to really um, help to, to clarify and focus the business on the growth priorities that are going to matter as it comes out of uh, what was a very difficult year. So that's just one example where I think, you know, the, the private equity model really has enabled us to support great leaders in our portfolio companies to, uh, to use the crisis moment to clarify for the organization, you know, what really matters and then double down on it. We're seeing a lot of kind of upticks in, in kind of key elements talking about coming out, uh, coming into an offensive out of the pandemic, uh, specifically on the deal front, right? Now, obviously, there's there's a significant uptick or there appears to be an uptick in the carve out side of the house, right? And there is the potential to see more of that, right? Two major drivers being kind of one, public corporations really focusing on the core operations, right? Just like you were talking about, and jettisoning of non core assets, really focusing on their core. Is um, is enabling some of that that asset availability. The other one is obviously there's with the new administration there is the potential for increased scrutiny over proposed mergers, and we're seeing some deal flow associated with that. The, the other kind of key areas that we're also seeing as far as the offense at that point of value creation, one is taking a look at the changing profile of the consumer and seeing what has been accelerated by the pandemic. So, for instance, um, in the health and beauty space there's less need for in-person consultation and more use of virtual consultation, right? And when you go down that path, there's obviously cost structure that you can improve and operating models that can be employed that kind of really support that, that in the future. The other one is because you've now had this time where you can reset the organization, right? There's also a discussion of how do we maximize our take of the tailwind coming out of the pandemic. And we've also seen that some investors, either one through kind of secondary or pipe type investments, partnering with the management team or primary PE partners to actually invest in the growth engines of the firms, create scale in the organization, and then drive and capture as much of that tailwind as possible. And that's been uh, pretty effective in their portfolio holdings. Have you seen uh, among the portfolio companies that you advise sort of good examples of, you know, seizing the day, um, whether it's through the M&A market or, or some other strategic moves? I had dinner with a CEO last night, as a matter of fact, of a, a, a company in the infrastructure space where, I mean, you know, the legislation that's very slowly moving through Washington, something will pass. I mean, there's there's all of that opportunity. But the gating issue there for this for this gentleman, for his organization is, you know, no surprise. It's finding workers. It's it's finding people to be able to hire. So the that seems to be a real critical bottleneck in all of the, in terms of playing offense, that seems to be a critical bottleneck at this time. I would also add just that, um, and this is coming from some data we have from Alex Partners just from the last couple of months, that you know senior executives and, and even mid-level executives aren't confident are uh, not confident in their, in their people's ability to really be able to manage the speed of change and the speed of disruption. And so this it's refocusing them now, I think a lot on, you know, do we have the right people in the right roles? Are we hiring resumes or are we hiring mindsets? That's a, that's a, a, a more subtle but important aspect of, again, that bottleneck around getting the right people in. We're going to be answering questions from the audience. So you can go ahead and start sending those questions in I'm just looking at a question that was sent in 
And if you don't mind, right. I'll just jump in and answer it. We have some data on this from our sixth annual private equity leadership survey. The question is, have you seen an increase in human capital due diligence? And we have um, actually found 53% of private equity resp respondents reported an increase in human capital due diligence during this time of disruption. So it's it's definitely on the minds of, of many investors. As we think about uh, making you know new investments during during this time, I think definitely we're not only increasing the human capital due diligence, but we're also really changing what we look for, right? We're not as focused as you know historically we might have been on the experience of the management team, and we're becoming much more keenly focused on some of the softer skills around leadership that you know that Ted and and Will discussed earlier. You know, the ability to connect authentically with employees across uh, across the organization, organization, the ability to be resilient and nimble and able to to change. Can you think of any examples from the clients that you advise? Um, without necessarily naming names, of really strong moves that were made during the pandemic that were in anticipation of the company coming out stronger and healthier on the other side, but with these moves made during the pandemic intended to uh, accelerate growth even more? I think here's what we saw, right? And I remember having a conversation with one of, one of my clients, and he just said, well, I it was, in, uh, it was between March and April of last year. He's like, it was a 95% revenue variance. I had to pull all the levers. We were talking about kind of how he gets himself back into a fighting position after, after having to, you know, largely cut an, a significant amount of cost structure out of his organization. Um, I think that those that obviously survived the pandemic, and, and by the way, like the infusion of liquidity into the market has been unprecedented. Um, right, like we were, I, we, I think that there was a lot of anticipation of a significant amount of distressed deals that just hasn't panned out, right? Uh, just because the liquidity in the market has been um, exceptional. And, and what you actually saw in 2020 was that 70, I think about 72% of the deals were actually add ons, tuck ins, right? So people in core, in, in some of the core um, the lines of business were actually during that period of time buying in the downturn and tucking in a number of acquisitions, which then allowed them to accelerate out of the um, accelerate out of the uh, of the pandemic in, in, in a much better position than they were. Those that really had to retrench are now looking at how do they actually capture that growth, right? And so we're seeing a lot of people investing in the growth engine of the firm, tailoring their order to cash processes um, in kind of getting themselves into that operational position where as the growth returns and as the growth has is returning, they can obviously accelerate into that revenue profile and, and, and capture as much of it as possible. At least that's kind of what we're seeing at this point. You mentioned that for the portfolio companies in your portfolio, they got hit hard by the pandemic as opposed to those that, you know, kind of saw an acceleration due to what happened during the pandemic. But those that got hit hard, you mentioned that it was a clarifying moment. Um, what do you mean by that? Can you expound on that a bit more uh, about how you know you can take that negative experience, turn it into something that can be applied for the betterment of the portfolio company going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 what I meant by that was really uh, in in a moment where you know you have literally no revenue or, or cash coming into a business because you've got such uh, an incredible shock uh, to to the business. You know, it forces leaders in that company to to think very critically about every expense, about every activity that they're spending time on, and that they're asking their teams to spend time on. And, uh, and there's also, you know, in, in those crisis moments, there's an enormous focus on serving the customer and ensuring that the, you know, the customer's experience through, through all of this is a good one or as good as it can be. And so I, I think that, you know, what we saw are management teams that were able to, to kind of recognize some of those non-core activities that had crept into their, you know, their time and their team's time and that, you know, potentially we're spending really valuable resources on and, you know, and very quickly recognize that, hey, that's actually not critical to the mission of the business and, and let those go. 
And at the same time, I think it, it um, you know, for, for companies that were really heavily impacted, it very much clarifies priorities around your customer and your, your people. And so, you know, we saw uh, our management teams get very, very in the weeds around what was the experience that customers were having and then uh, what, was, what was the experience that their teams were having. And I think that that's clarifying because those, you know, fundamentally that's what, what drives the business is, uh, you know, customer demand and the people who are able to, to serve it. Ted, you know, on the subject of clarifying moments, uh, did you see portfolio companies and their private equity sponsors take the opportunity to look harder at how ESG becomes a driver of excellence in the company during the pandemic? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important um, question, David. And, and just first, starting with, with the data from our survey, you know, we asked a couple of questions around ESG and we, we got um, a lack of response. Um, but we did get 56% of PE investors saying that they're interested and want to learn more. I'd especially be interested in Anne's perspective on this. What, what I'm seeing with, with, with the investors and CEOs that I'm talking to is that this is very much on their radar screen, but they're, we're still in very early innings in knowing kind of what to do about it and how to integrate it into the whole value creation discussion. We focused a lot on ensuring that our companies were were really considering all the stakeholders, you know, when they needed to make an unfortunate decision to furlough or lay off any workers. Um, and we put a lot of effort behind that and then also developed a program to provide transitional support services to uh, employees of our portfolio companies who are impacted by COVID-related workforce actions. And, and that that has you know continues to to be something that you know we uh, have embedded into our firm and, and continue to do going forward, regardless of of whether we're in the middle of a pandemic. And then you know I would say that KKR has long been you know aspiring to leadership in ESG. I, I don't think anybody <laughs> across the industry has totally figured out how to how to balance all the competing interests perfectly. But I would say that, you know, we have only seen it become more and more important, both in terms of maintaining, you know, our sort of license to operate and our, um, you know, our reason for, for being a compelling business model for, for companies to partner with us, as well as, you know, increasing importance to our, to our LPs. And so coming out of this year, we've only redoubled our efforts and are investing more in providing resources and structure to ESG issues across our portfolio, you know, including climate change, you know, shareholder people issues, uh, you know, our focus on DEI and so forth. Ted, have you seen a change in hold or exit times as a result of the disruption? We've got 40% of investors extending hold times as a result of uh, as a result of COVID, but a very low number saying that they're changing their fundamental investment strategy. That's from the survey that Alex Partners put out recently that will be made available to everyone who has signed up for yeah. this webinar. Are you sensing um, optimism from private equity investors about what comes next, uh, that this uh, pandemic has been kind of a testing period that ultimately will uh, put uh, most portfolio companies on stronger footing going forward? I'm hearing a lot of optimism um, in the sense in, in the, you know, for the macroeconomic rebound. What I'm not hearing, rather the, pe the pessimism I'm hearing is around whether they're going to be able to meet their needs for talent. That's really, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, even in my, my dinner meeting last night was, you know, you know, the ability to source and hire and retain the right talent, it seems to be the key gating issue at this point. So optimism for the overall macro economic rebound that we're all hoping for. Um, but the gating issue there is talent. Great. Maybe I can ask a follow-up question uh, for Anne at KKR Capstone. You know, obviously, KKR is one of the leaders among private equity firms in providing resources to their portfolio companies uh, in the form of, you know, the, the, the many uh, tools in the toolkit from KKR Capstone. With regard to human capital, when, when there's a challenge that a portfolio company leader is facing and they reach out to someone like you, what does that look like? 
we really rely a lot on the power of our portfolio. If you think about, you know, just the scale of, uh, of our firm and the investments that we have, we actually have a ton of great things happening across the portfolio. And so it almost becomes um, an opportunity to really share best practices. Uh, and so oftentimes, you know, as human capital leaders in our portfolio reach out, we're actually, you know, sourcing a lot of the solutions uh, back through the, the portfolio as well. Um, we also have, I, I would say, a, a really um, strong partnership with a number of providers in the human capital space, and so we're able to, to, to make those introductions and bring trusted partners to bear, uh, to, depending on the topic. And I think one of the things that we've particularly focused on developing in the last several years are resources around uh, diversity and inclusion, and not only um, focused on helping companies, you know, create DNI programs, but really with a lens on what Ted was just talking about. How do we open up new sources of talent that we might not have, you know, kind of thought about previously? What would you say are the key skills and experiences that were most useful during the pandemic that could really move the needle for these portfolio companies? I realize that's a big question and you've got a short amount of time to answer it. I'm going to say it varies, uh, right? Like you, you have every, there's different types of models associated with the operating partners. I think the key one, the one thing that is, is I think common amongst all the successful operating partners is that they really want to see the companies that they're working with succeed. And they, they kind of put themselves at the, disposable, at the disposal of the management team to kind of make sure that that management team is successful. That is penultimate. Um, and then I think and that's more of an attitude discussion. The underlying operating models of the, in, uh, of the individual private equity firms, it stems anything from you know, hands-on interim roles all the way through to just advisory. And that's going to be a manifestation of, and, and kind of that success is going to be dependent on how you fit into into that operating model at, at, at a given private equity firm and the advisors that you typically bring on to help you, right? Because um, you're not going to know everything. And the key element that I've always seen with leadership is know what you're not good at and hire against it as quickly as you can. Uh, so that way you never have that weakness exposed. You know, th th those are some of the key things that I've I would kind of highlight to you. The critical success factor is to make your management team successful. And if the management team is successful, then you're successful as an operating partner. Um, and so I, I think from that perspective, it's all about going back to, you know, aligned incentives and being focused on driving the right outcomes for the business in, in really a supporting role. We'd like to thank Alex Partners for being our partner on this webinar and also Ann Arlinghouse from uh, KKR Capstone, Ted Belillis and Will Bundy, both from Alex Partners. Thank you all for sharing your insights with us, and thank you to the audience. Like what you hear on the PrivCap podcast? Visit PrivCap.com for more thought leadership interviews, articles, reports, webinars, and more.